Okay, great. Um, so thanks, Carola, you know, Des, Alex, IMA, and all the organizers. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, large scale derivative free optimization. This is joint work with uh, Cora Cartis from Oxford. Um, and so I will get right into it. And so, what I want to go through today is first just to give a background into derivative free optimization, DFO, because um, it's something that I imagine uh, there's a good number of people here that haven't come across uh, this in great uh, detail before. And then I'm going to sort of go into the new work. So look at uh, subspace DFO methods from kind of a general algorithm and kind of theoretical point of view, and then kind of drill down into uh, a specialization to solving least squares problems. So a little bit about the theory, but really diving into how we can make these methods kind of work well uh, from a practical point of view. And we'll uh, show some results at the end. So what I'm generally going to be covering here is just uh, general unconstrained nonlinear optimization. So we've got some objective function f uh, that we're optimizing over Rn. And I'm just going to assume it's sufficiently smooth for whatever it is that we need to do here. Um, in terms of the sort of categorization here, I'm not really going to assume much about f. So it's potentially non-convex, uh, potentially black box. So I don't know anything about kind of the analytical structure of it. Um, I, in, in practically the way these algorithms are designed, in fact, we don't even need to be able to get F exactly. So we can cope with inaccurate evaluations of F. This could come from things like uh, random errors in there. So Monte Carlo simulations or something like that, or uh, maybe more deterministic errors like finite termination of uh, an infinite iterative procedure. And when I say we're going to be minimizing F, what I'm really going to be looking for is a local minimizer, which uh, is important in the non-convex regime. But actually, I'm going to be asking even less than that and say, really, what I'm actually going to be looking for is an approximate stationary point. So I want to find a point where the norm of the gradient is small. And there's obviously a whole um, world of different techniques for solving this. But the general category I'm going to be looking at here are called trust region methods. And uh, these are kind of very well used kind of state of the art techniques. Um, but of the different techniques, I'm selecting this because it adapts very well to the derivative free setting. And I'll explain how that works in a couple of minutes. So in the kind of general world of trust region problems, I need to kind of talk about how they work first. And ultimately, really what this boils down to is um, approximating your objective function f. So the idea is at an iteration k, we've got an approximate solution xk. And what we want to do is approximate our objective uh, in a neighborhood around xk. And the most natural way to do that, uh, in all likelihood, is to use a Taylor series. So uh, generally speaking, we use a local quadratic Taylor series, um, as I've sort of put up there. And the idea is that um, if we want to minimize f, well, let's replace the difficult problem of minimizing f with the easier problem of minimizing that quadratic approximation. And we just hope that as long as that approximation is good, then we'll be sent in the right direction. So what we're going to do is take our uh, Taylor series and minimize it in a neighborhood around our iterate xk. And the idea of putting a neighborhood around it essentially boils down to the fact that we know that Taylor series are accurate for small steps. If we go too far away, we can't really rely on its accuracy. So let's constrain how far we go and then minimize our model in that neighborhood. And that tells us a potential step SK uh, and where we might go after that. And what we'll do then, having calculated a tentative step, what we're going to do is accept it or reject it. So the way we're going to decide that is we're going to evaluate our objective at our new point, XK plus SK. And depending on whether or not we decreased F enough, uh, we're going to say either, if we did get sufficient decrease, then we're very happy. We'll take our step there and that becomes our new iterate. If we didn't get sufficient decrease, then we're going to stay where we were. And what we also do uh, is adjust this radius, the, the size of the neighborhood that we were looking at, this delta k. So if things are going well, if we're getting good decrease, uh, we may well want to increase the size of delta k so we can take bigger steps in future and cover more ground quickly. Uh, but if things are going badly, what we're going to do is we're going to stay put and we're going to shrink the size of delta. We're going to shrink the neighborhood we look over because eventually, if we keep shrinking delta, then we're going to guarantee that we're in a neighborhood where our Taylor series is very accurate. Because we know eventually, if we shrink the size of the neighborhood, it is definitely going to be accurate. So this is kind of the basic idea uh, behind trust region methods. They're very popular. They work very well in practice. And you can get all sorts of kind of theoretical guarantees, the most natural of which is that uh, the gradients 
uh, of f at these iterates go to zero uh, as the algorithm progresses. However, and sort of uh, maybe there's a bit of clue in the title, the one question that comes up with all of this is that I started with building uh, my local quadratic Taylor series. And the first thing that we have to be able to do is get out the gradient and the Hessian of f uh, evaluated at a particular point xk. And so the first question that we come up with is how are we actually going to do that? And there's kind of three basic approaches for doing this. The first one is just to differentiate in the obvious way. You write down the formula, you differentiate it, you write a piece of code that evaluates that function. Um, or you can do finite differencing, uh, or if you are sort of um, got more sophisticated computational tools available, you can use algorithmic differentiation, which basically breaks down the, uh, the source code that evaluates f and builds a new piece of source code, essentially, that can evaluate the gradients uh, of f. So those are kind of the three basic techniques uh, for estimating these gradients. But there's kind of a few situations where none of these methods are really very suitable. So if you've got your function f being black box, so you don't know the analytic form of it, then you can't write code by hand because you don't know um, what f is, so you can't differentiate it. And you can't use algorithmic differentiation either because that needs access to the underlying source code. So you might have to turn to finite differencing. The problem is if your function is noisy, so it's got errors in it, or if it's computationally expensive or potentially both, then the gradients you get out are gonna be potentially inaccurate or they're gonna take so long for you to get because it's an expensive function that it may not be practical for you to get those out. And so when so if any or all of these situations occur, that's uh, where people turn to derivative free optimization DFO. And yeah, there's applications kind of in a variety of different areas, essentially boiling down to the situation where you hit those three dot points. So for instance, um, I've done some work in climate where you get um, very expensive functions coming from say global climate simulations. Uh, I put experimental design down there because you can't differentiate a laboratory experiment. Uh, people are building uses in machine learning and various other areas as well. Um, and, and there's a few different kind of varieties um, of DFO methods. Perhaps the most uh, famous that people might have heard of is the Nelda Mead method. Um, there's direct search techniques, but the kind of category I'm going to focus on is called model based. Um, and the idea is that it really tries to borrow from this kind of Taylor series type approach that we get in the derivative based situation, this kind of classic trust region method. The idea being that these methods work really well when you do have derivatives. So let's try and get as much of that good stuff as we can uh, into this derivative free context. So how does that work? So the idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to take this quadratic Taylor series that we had potential problems with uh, dealing with because we can't get the gradient in the Hessian. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace the gradient with some vector G and the Hessian with some matrix H. And all we're going to do is say, I want to find a G and an H without using the derivatives. So that, that's all we need to do. And we still get a quadratic approximation to F. Of course, the natural question is, how are we going to do that? And the way we do that is through interpolation. So what we're going to do is we're going to maintain a cloud of points here that I've denoted script Y. And we're going to say, I'm going to evaluate my objective at those points. And then I'm going to say, I need to fit a quadratic function to those uh, data points that I have. So I'm going to find my G and an H that meets this interpolation condition for all points in my interpolation set. And that's it. So I build an interpolating function rather than a Taylor series. And all we can then do uh, is just swap out um, the Taylor series and put in our new interpolation based model inside the trust region method. And essentially everything works. There's a couple of little caveats that we need to deal with though. The first um, thing we need to deal with is the situation when things are going badly. If we didn't manage, if we calculate our step, but we didn't decrease our true objective. Previously, I just said, let's shrink delta and we're happy. Uh, in the DFO situation, there's two reasons that things might not be working. The first is that delta is too large. The other reason is because we've got maybe a not very good set of interpolation points. So our interpolation model isn't a very good approximation. That's not something that you have when you have a Taylor series because that's guaranteed to have a certain level of accuracy. So there's two reasons that things might go wrong. So we need to decide when things are going wrong. What are we going to deal with? How are we going to try and fix it? The other big issue that we need to deal with is how do we know when to stop? In a traditional situation, you might say, well, let's stop when the norm of the gradient is small, which is great if you have gradients. In this case, we don't. 
So what we need to do is add in a few kind of tricks that basically mean that this uh, radius, the size of this neighborhood delta, is basically going to be of comparable size to the norm of the gradient of the true objective, even though we don't know what that is. So we try and um, couple those two together. And what that means is that we can then use delta as a clear measure of progress, even in the absence of gradients. So delta going, be, becoming small, uh, we can use as kind of an indicator that things are going well and we may want to stop our method. And kind of at a really high level, the way uh, these sorts of techniques work uh, from a theoretical point of view is basically to say, and there are results here that say that if our point interpolation points are good in some sense, and I mean that in the sense that they're very well spaced, so they don't all lie in a subspace or anything kind of degenerate like that. If your points are well spaced, then you can prove that the resulting interpolation model is as accurate an approximation to F as a Taylor series, uh, as a comparable Taylor series, so say a quadratic or linear Taylor series, uh, up to a changing constants. So up to constants, we get just as good as a Taylor series. And if you're essentially as good as a Taylor series, then all the sort of standard convergence results of the standard methods all follow through. So that's kind of the basic uh, underlying idea behind all the theory. Uh, to give a quick kind of demonstration, just so we've got a good picture in mind, uh, this is roughly how it works. So I'm trying to minimize the blue objective function to find the red minimizer. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to sample um, some points, which are the circles in black. So these are the points that I've evaluated uh, the objective F at. And the best of those points is going to be my current iterate because you know, it's got the best objective value. And so the shaded region is a neighborhood. It's just an interval. Uh, of radius delta around that iterate. So this is kind of my initial setup. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build a quadratic function that interpolates those three dots, those three black dots. And that gives me the black line here. And now I'm going to say I want to minimize my quadratic model, minimize the black line inside the shaded region. And so that's going to send me off to the right hand edge of that region. So I'm going to grab that point. I'm going to evaluate the objective there. And lo and behold, uh, it's decreased quite a lot. So it hasn't decreased quite as much as the black line. So it's not quite as good as the model, but it's done a pretty good job. So we're happy with this. And we're going to say this is going to be our new point. So we're happy with this point. We want to use it. So we're going to add it into our interpolation set. Now, the problem is if I want to interpolate a quadratic function in 1D, I can only use three interpolation points for that to be uh, uniquely defined. So I need to throw out an old point. And here we have to think a little bit more about the geometry of the points we've got. But in this kind of simple example, I'm going to throw away the point on the left hand edge because it's sort of the furthest away from where is looking good and it happens to have the worst objective value. Uh, in higher dimensions, we need to be a lot more careful than what I'm doing here, but this is just kind of illustrative. So I'm going to throw away the point that I've now circled in red and replace it with my new iterate here in pink. And things were going well, so I'm going to expand my radius. Uh, and now I've got a new quadratic model with these new three points, and I'm going to minimize that. Again, I'm going to be sent off, if I minimize the black line, I'm sent off to the right-hand edge. So I can evaluate that point, and we've got a pretty good decrease again. So F has decreased quite a lot. Again, not quite as much as the model, but still good enough. So we're going to throw away a bad point, and we'll add in our new point, and we'll end up with something like this. And now, again, we've got our quadratic model. If we minimize it, we'll end up on the right-hand edge um, of our trust region again, the shaded region. But now, even though I've decreased the model, decreased the black line, I've actually gone uphill compared to my current iterate in the true objective. So I've not achieved that sufficient decrease condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I don't want to move to this right-hand edge point. I'm going to stay where I am, and I'm going to shrink the size of my trust region. But what I am going to do is be careful with how I manage my interpolation set. So I'm going to say, let's actually throw away an old point in red and add in this new point. Because even though it increased f, it still gives me useful information about where f, uh, how, how the function behaves. So just because it didn't decrease the objective doesn't mean it didn't tell me something useful. In fact, f being large does actually tell me something useful. It says, go in the other direction. So I want to add in this new point and shrink the size of my region. And now I end up with a quadratic model that actually looks like a very good approximation. And I minimize that. And I basically end up at the solution. So that's kind of the underlying idea behind these methods. So we build an interpolation model, minimize it, and accept or reject the step based on how well that prediction worked out. 
So from a theoretical point of view, um, one of the key pieces of analysis that people look at with these techniques is uh, what's called worst case complexity analysis. And essentially that's asking if I have an a, a level of accuracy epsilon that I want to be guaranteed, how many iterations do I have to wait before that is guaranteed? And this gives a rough table of some of the key results. So the first question is, what does it even mean to have a certain accuracy order? And there's kind of two ones, two levels that are kind of the most common that people look at. Uh, in the first order accuracy, all we ask is that the norm of the gradient is small. So that hopefully will send us towards minimizer, but there's a chance we might end up at a saddle point or something like that. But it still gives us a reasonably useful guide to how things are performing. Uh, if we want to be a little more careful, we might look at second order accuracy, which says what we want is a small gradient and our Hessian to be approximately positive semi-definite. So its eigenvalues are positive or maybe only slightly negative up to minus epsilon. And the standard results for complexity analysis for DFO is very similar to what you get in the derivative base case with Taylor series models. Um, so the key result is if you look at the dependency on epsilon, it goes from epsilon to the minus two, if you want first order accuracy, down to epsilon to the minus three, if you want second order accuracy. And that matches exactly what you get in the classic uh, derivative base case as well. The problem with DFO though, is that we have these constants, these dependency on the problem dimension n, so how many variables we're trying to optimize. So if in first order, there's an n squared dependency on dimension and it blows up to n to the ninth with second order accuracy. And that's essentially because uh, they, they come out because of the error formulae for linear or quadratic interpolation. And those have dependencies on n, whereas the error in your Taylor series uh, doesn't have an explicit dependency on the dimension. So we get the same epsilon dependency but a bad dependency on the problem dimension. On top of that, uh, there's actually a lot of work we have to do at every iteration of our method to build interpolation models and to keep track of our points to make sure they have nice geometry. So we end up with models that are reasonably accurate. Uh, if we're gonna do linear models, which is typically for a first order accuracy method, that boils down to needing about n cubed flops per iteration. And if we want second order accuracy, we usually have to solve an n squared by n squared linear system at every iteration. So we end up needing about n to the six flops per iteration, as well as the iteration count having an n to the nine factor in there. So these methods have a very strong dependency on the problem dimension, both in the just the number of iterations required and also in the amount of linear algebra work at every step. And so a big challenge uh, in this area is uh, the question, how can we make DFO methods scalable? How can we make them cope when n is large because of these really bad dependencies that we've got? And that's really what we're addressing here. And just to give you kind of a, uh, I guess a spoiler for where we're heading, uh, this is what's going to happen uh, with the method we're looking at. So we're gonna look at first order accuracy and we're gonna be able to get rid entirely of this n squared dependency and match exactly what you get in the Taylor series case. And the order n cubed work in linear algebra per iteration is going to become order n, it's going to become linear. So we're going to be able to make a massive improvement uh, over what's already out there. So let's have a uh, talk about that and let's jump into the new stuff. So how are we going to make DFO methods scalable? So there's a few techniques already out there. Um, so the first category, which is uh, sort of in the model-based uh, world, is essentially built around exploiting problem structure. So things like if I know that the true Hessian of F has a certain sparsity pattern or these sorts of ideas. So really exploiting some known problem structure if you happen to have it. Uh, otherwise, there's a growing family of techniques based on kind of randomized methods. So um, in recent years, particularly in the machine learning community, people have been looking at randomized finite differencing approaches, which they call gradient sampling. And there's also been some recent work on direct search methods. So another kind of big category of DFO methods where they randomly sample certain search directions. And in that case, they're able to, in the first order case, uh, reduce their complexity from an N squared to N dependency. So sort of similar to where we're going, but not quite as far. And next obvious question is why would we care about this? So uh, we have been really limited in the scale that DFO can get to, but if we could go higher, there's definitely applications out there in machine learning. Uh, I've done some work in image analysis, which uh, would be a lot better if we could solve uh, large scale DFO methods. And potentially it could even be used as an approximation for global optimization techniques, because global optimization has a very strong kind of 
fundamental dependency on the problem dimension that you can't really avoid. Um, whereas sort of local optimization methods like these DFO techniques don't. So potentially uh, DFO could be used as a stand-in for some global optimization techniques in places. So what are we going to do? We're going to use a subspace method. And the idea is that instead of calculating a step that's based on searching through all of Rn for a good place to move to, we're only going to search in a low dimensional subspace of Rn when we figure out where we're going to go next. And this is kind of similar to coordinate descent methods. If you're aware of those ones, uh, that's essentially where you pick one variable or maybe a small number of variables and you just optimize those at every iteration and you change which variables you're going to do it each time. Uh, there are some implementation, implementations out there already, and there have been for a few years, but it's not really something that's been studied uh, heavily from a theoretical point of view. And so from a theoretical point of view, we're going to really build on some recent analysis that uh, Cora has done with uh, Yari Fouts and Zhen Xiao at Oxford um, in the derivative base case. So that um, we're going to use those ideas, but there's a lot of extra kind of wrinkles that are added in in the derivative free case once we lose all that information. There's a lot more work we have to do to get that working. So the overall framework is that uh, we're going to pick a dimension p, and that's going to be a dimension of our subspace. And so we're going to pick a, dimension, a subspace of dimension p at every iteration. And I'm just going to say that's given by the column space of some tall, skinny matrix. And that matrix is going to be randomly generated. It's going to, I'm going to call it q. And once we've picked that subspace, we're going to build a low dimensional model. So we're going to find a small vector in RP and a small matrix P by P. Uh, so these G hat and H hat and the hats all the way through are going to mean quantities in the small space in RP. And we're going to use these smaller uh, values to be an interpolating quadratic model to F, but it's only going to be an interpolating model inside. So the affine space given by our current iterate and then perturbed by something in the column space of Q. So we're only going to bother approximating F in this low dimensional space uh, given, and we're going to build a quadratic interpolation model to do that. But we're going to do that in exactly the same way as what we did in the regular DFO case. So once we've done that, we're going to uh, solve a subspace trust region subproblem. We're going to say, let's minimize our low dimensional model in a low dimensional space, again, subject to uh, living inside some neighborhood. So everything is just going to be shrunk down to RP or some sort of p-dimensional space. And there's sort of two big benefits we get out of this. The first one is that we don't need as many interpolation points uh, because we're building a model in RP. So for instance, there's, there's fewer degrees of freedom in G and H that we need to interpolate. And the other big benefit is that the linear algebra is cheap because everything's in sort of RP. Everything's in sort of p-dimensional spaces. So we don't need to do as much work at every iteration. The next thing that we need is to figure out the choice of subspace. So how are we going to decide um, what subspace is to search in? And the way we're going to say it is we want to pick a subspace where there's enough potential to decrease f, we, where we're confident that there's enough room for us to uh, keep decreasing f by a good amount. And the criteria we're going to use, I'm going to call it well-aligned. And that basically says that if you take the gradient of f and project it into the subspace, that you maintain at least some fraction of the gradient. You don't lose a large chunk of the gradient. So there's enough gradients living in this subspace that you can kind of do something interesting in this space. So that's the criteria I'm going to be asking for. And what we're going to assume is that uh, this property, this well-aligned property, is going to hold with some high probability. So probability 1 minus delta, whenever we choose to resample it. We're also going to need that these Qs are uniformly bounded, but that's more a technical assumption. The big question is, why am I making this assumption? Why am I using this well-aligned property? And the idea is that we can show that if we've got still got work to do, if the norm of our gradient is big, so we shouldn't have stopped by now, and if we've got a good subspace and we've got a good model. So uh, this, the technical term here is fully linear. This is where it's as good as a Taylor series up to constants. So if we've got enough work still to do, we've got a good subspace and a good model, then the norm of G, so the model gradient that we're going to get, is also going to be big. It's going to be of size epsilon. So the intuitive idea is this well-aligned criteria tells us that if there is still work for us to do, if we shouldn't be done yet, if uh, norm of grade F is greater f is still big, 
then the algorithm is going to know it. The algorithm is going to see a gradient that is also big, probably, because we've got this probabilistic criteria. So if there's still work to do, then we're probably aware of it. So that's what we're going to be asking. And so this uh, is the full algorithm, essentially, um, leaving out some of the kind of technical details, but this is the basic idea. So what I've done here is I've added a couple of colors. So what I've put in blue is basically standard um, things that we get in model-based DFO that you don't get in the derivative-based case. So the blue stuff is standard DFO. The red stuff is the thing that is new to our random subspace method. So just to kind of go through it, in steps one and two, we're basically going to make a choice. Most of the time, we're going to be in step two. Most of the time, at every iteration, we're going to pick a new random subspace and we're going to build our model uh, through some interpolation method. However, sometimes in, we're going to hit step one. And what we're going to do in step one is that we're going to reuse our previous subspace and we're going to guarantee that the model we use is good. We're going to guarantee that it's a fully linear category. But most of the time, we'll just pick a random subspace and build a model there. But sometimes we will need to guarantee certain things. So in steps one and two, we pick our subspace. Then in step three, we say that if our, we think that we're close, if we think we're nearly done in the sense that our model gradient is small, then we're just going to make sure that things are going well. We're going to make sure we have a good model. We're going to make sure that our radius, trust region radius delta is close to the true gradient of f. And that's called a criticality step. That's a standard DFO procedure. And I'm not going to go into too many details here. Then we do the standard trust region stuff. We minimize our model, in this case, in a subspace. So we have to project back up. We're going to evaluate F at our new point. We're going to check if we got a good decrease. And then we're going to make our decisions. So the first case is if we got sufficient decrease, if things are going to go well, then we're going to take our step. We're going to increase our trust region radius because things are going well. And we're going to add our new point into our interpolation model. Then we have to make a decision if things are going badly. If things are going badly and we have a bad model, we have what's called a model improving step. So if we've got no decrease and we've got a bad model, we're going to stay put. We're going to keep everything the same. All we're going to do is make our model fully linear. And we're going to set this flag to make sure we stay in the same subspace next time. So next time, we have a good model and in the same subspace and everything else is the same. Otherwise, if we didn't see a decrease and we had a good model, then we definitely have to shrink delta. So we've got what we call an unsuccessful step. We stay where we are and we shrink delta. So yeah, the blue stuff is standard DFO. The red stuff is new in this subspace idea. And this is the basic result that we get. What we say is uh, our main convergence result says that if we've got a smooth F and it's bounded below, we have a technical condition about uh, how we update delta, how we increase and shrink it. But what we say is if k epsilon is the first iteration where the norm of the gradient is small, so we achieve accuracy epsilon at iteration k, that that is going to be approximately a size epsilon to the minus 2 with some high probability that goes to 0, uh, that, that goes to 1, sorry, as epsilon goes to 0, with constants that also depend on our well-aligned condition alpha and the probability of well-aligned 1 minus delta. So this matches the epsilon to the minus 2 bound from the standard sort of first order analysis that I showed in the table earlier with high probability now because of our randomization. Uh, we can also show that that means epsilon to the minus 2 iterations in expectation, or we can get almost sure convergence as well. And the crucial thing is this constant c does not depend on n. The, un the underlying dimension depends on p, the subspace dimension, and that comes from our interpolation error bounds. And so we'll have a look at uh, how this turns out uh, shortly. And just to give a rough idea of how we go on about proving this, basically we say while there's still work to be done, so while the norm of the gradient is still big, there's basically six situations that can happen. The first five happen when we have a good subspace, and the last one happens when we have a bad subspace. So the first condition says if our radius is large and we've got good decrease, what happens is we can prove that we've decreased f by a certain amount that's at least of size epsilon squared. And so that happens at most epsilon to the minus two times because there's a, only a fixed amount that we can ever possibly decrease f because it's bounded below. On the other hand, if delta is large and it's unsuccessful, we can actually bound how many times that happens by how many times scenario one happens based on how we update this trust region radius delta. Because every time it was successful, we increase it. Every time it's unsuccessful, we decrease delta. So the amount of decreases have to be offset by the number of increases that we have. 
Um, otherwise, delta gets too small and we drop out of case two. Then we've got three cases that look at uh, when our ra radius is small. So if we've got a small delta and we had a bad step, but a good model, it turns out that that doesn't happen because a good model means we're just as accurate as the Taylor series. And when your radius is sufficiently small, then your model has to be as good as the Taylor series. Taylor series are good, so you get a good decrease. So this case uh, eventually doesn't happen. So we only have to worry about cases four and five, where we've got a small delta and a successful step. And there we have to look at the same kind of delta management of increases and decreases, and we can control that with categories three and five. On the other hand, if we've got a bad model, what we immediately do is we stay fixed, we keep our subspace, we keep our delta, and we definitely build a good, good model. And what that means is that we never end up back in case five more than once in a row. Every time we hit case five, we jump back and we end up in three or four the next time. The last category is if we've got a bad subspace and we assume that that happens with small probability, so we don't need to worry about it very much. Uh, we need this technical condition on these gammas to ensure uh, that we don't decrease delta too quickly when, these, uh, when this bad subspace condition happens. Uh, there's a lot of extra kind of difficulties that I'm not going through here. The first one being that all of these five delta large and delta small cases all happen at different values of large and small. So we have to cope with that as well as many other things. And I don't really have time to talk about that in more detail, but that's the basic idea. The last thing I haven't mentioned is how do I get these subspaces in kind of a tangible way? I know what assumption I want, which is that I keep as good fraction of the gradient with high probability, but how do I actually get that? So the most natural way of doing this would be to pick a random orthonormal set, you know, randomly pick some uh, coordinates, some variables that we're going to live in. Um, and it turns out that if you're going to go down that approach, you need your subspace dimension to be proportional to n. Essentially, if I want to capture 10% of the gradient, I need 10% of the dimensions. Um, so there we have p depending on n, which if I go back to the result here, I said c depends on n. And so our complexity bound then depends on the ambient dimension. So this isn't, uh, this does still improve things, but it's not quite as good as what we might want. So it turns out a better thing to do is to use what's called a johnson linden strauss embedding. And this is um, a sort of a category that's very well used in things like randomized linear algebra. And uh, I won't go into the details here, but basically there are some easy ways to construct it. For instance, if you take uh, a matrix with IID Gaussian entries, uh, or you can build sparse versions of these matrices that have kind of randomly chosen non-zero entries with randomly chosen values. But either way, uh, you get some really nice properties from these types of matrices. And the key thing is that the value of P that you need to get this well-aligned property is independent of the ambient dimension N. And so if we pull everything together, what this means is that we get exactly the complexity bound that I said I would get to. So we drop out the N squared from standard model-based DFO, and we have a complexity bound that's independent of the ambient dimension. And so it matches the kind of the Taylor error bound in that situation. Okay, I now want to look at uh, how we specialize this in practice to least squares problems. So in least squares problems, they think, imagine data fitting and these sorts of things. It's a very important category of problem. Uh, what we're minimizing is now the two norm of uh, function R. And here we could use this structure a little bit more. So in the classical case, what we would generally do is rather than do a quadratic approximation to F, we would do a linear Taylor series approximation to R using the Jacobian. And so in the derivative free setting, we do the same thing. Instead of uh, using the true Jacobian J, we use some matrix J and we find it using linear interpolation. Uh, either way, we end up with uh, a model for R and what we do to get a model for F is we square it. So we square our linear approximation. So we get a quadratic model for F. It's not quite as good as a quadratic Taylor series, but in practice, it's essentially good enough for most situations. And we've got uh, several versions of this idea and uh, in particular we have a code called DFOLS uh, that's in the NAG library but it's also uh, open source available if you're interested in that sort of thing. So if we look at the theoretical analysis what we've shown is that for first order methods, first order accuracy sorry, we still get epsilon to the minus two when we use this Gauss-Newton type approximation but we get an n to the sixth dependency on dimension which is sitting somewhere between first and second order methods which is sort of reflecting the fact that these Gauss-Newton models are somewhere between a linear and a quadratic Taylor series in terms of their accuracy. 
However, if we use this approximation inside this randomized subspace technique, again, we can remove that n to the six and we get a dimension independent worst case complexity bound. However, I'm going to go a little bit more and look more at the practicalities now. So the first thing is the linear algebra cost of this uh, Gauss-Newton method in the DFO setting uh, is approximately mn squared plus n cubed flops per iteration. So n is the problem dimension, m is the number of terms in your least squared sum, how many data points you're fitting to. Uh, when we go down to a randomized method though, we drop down to, uh, we, lose two we lose a factor of n squared from both and we replace it with p squared. And p, uh, we could choose to be independent of n. So we go from n cubed down to n in terms of linear algebra cost. The problem is the way that I've uh, framed this uh, RSDFO method, this randomized subspace method, is we're going to randomly regenerate a new subspace, which means that at every iteration, we're going to forget all of the evaluations of R that we had before because they lived in a subspace we don't care about anymore. Whereas if we look at the standard methods, they try and reuse these evaluations of R as much as they can, uh, motivated by the idea that they're potentially quite expensive to get. So the next question is, can we build a method that still has reduced linear algebra costs? So it gets rid of these of n squared or n cubed type terms, but it's also efficient in how many evaluations we do of this residual. And what we do uh, in this practical technique is to use the locations of our interpolation points to tell us which subspace to search in. So the idea is that we're going to maintain p plus 1 interpolation points. So that's going to include our iterate and p other points. And we're going to use qk to be a basis for the set of search directions that we have, these y minus xks. And we're going to do a QR factorization to get there. So when we do that, we get a low linear algebra cost. The problem is whenever we go to calculate a step, we're going to stay in the column space of this Q, which means that we're never going to find a point that's outside our initial subspace, our initial set of search directions, which is a bit of a problem unless we got super lucky and picked a really good starting subspace. So what we're going to need on top of this is a mechanism to search the whole space. Essentially, we're going to need to change Q at each iteration, change the directions we search in. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace some interpolation points with random orthogonal directions. So we're sort of ending up with a bit of a no free lunch type situation is if we want to uh, change our subspace to search everywhere, we're going to do need more evaluations. So there's a bit of a tension going on here. So how does this work in practice? In practice, the algorithm is very simple. DFBGN derivative free block Gauss Newton. What we're going to do is we're going to build our low dimensional model using our existing interpolation set to define our subspace. We're going to calculate a low dimensional step. We're going to evaluate it, do the standard trust region things. And then we're going to add our new point to the interpolation step set because it always gives us good information. But we're then going to delete a few of them. And we're going to delete them and replace them with some orthogonal directions and build it up so that we end up with the same number of points and we can start again. So this is a little bit short, a little bit simpler than the theoretical method, which is nice. Uh, what I should say about this is requiring with that we remove at least two points means uh, that we delete enough points to guarantee that our new search space is different to our previous search space. So that guarantees us that we search everywhere. Uh, practically, what it turns out that really helps is to use approximately two, uh, only delete two points when things are going well. So don't change our subspace very much if things are going well. Uh, if things are going badly, then to delete about 10% of our interpolation step, interpolation points, 10% of our search dimensions. Uh, because things aren't going well, so let's maybe look at a different subspace. And we have to do that in a geometry aware way. But once we do that, we get exactly this very low linear algebra cost that I was mentioning. So order n or order n plus m, depending on whether it's the number of residuals or variables that's uh, constraining you here. But that's still a massive reduction compared to mn squared plus n cubed we had in the standard method. And this code is publicly available. So I've got a couple minutes left, I think. So I'll uh, quickly go through some numerical results. And what I'm going to do here is compare DFBGN, this block method, to DFOLS, this state-of-the-art full space method. Um, so what I'm going to plot here is essentially the percentage of my test problems that I've solved, or proportion of my test problems solved, versus some measure of budget, how many times I've evaluated the objective. So higher lines are better. And so if I look at uh, low accuracy solutions, because this seems to be uh, where these block methods are most practical. 
uh, I get very good performance if I use DFBGM with a full block. If I use P equals N, I get this blue line and I'm basically matching state of the art, even though these block methods are a little bit more wasteful with their evaluation. So I, there's sort of, I wouldn't expect to do better than the original method, even with a full block method. But we get this really nice uh, reduction in performance as we decrease our block dimension in this way when we measure things in terms of evaluations. And this is for a medium scale test set of about 100 dimensional problems. However, if we go up a little bit more um, to a thousand dimensional problems, and to be practical, I have to impose a 12 hour timeout on every solver run for every problem, things start to look very, very different. Our full block methods, the blue and the black lines can solve a bunch of problems, but then they just stop. There's sort of a limit to how good they can get for in a lot of problems and they kind of stagnate with what they can solve. Whereas these smaller block methods can just keep going with their progress. In particular, the pink line is using block size as 1% of the ambient dimension. And so here it can just keep going and it can actually outperform these full block methods on these very large scale problems, thousand dimensional least squares problems. So we can outperform state of the art methods in this case. And the reason is because we don't hit the timeout because this low linear algebra cost um, avoids us hitting uh, hitting this timeout. So if we look at the percentage of problems that I hit this 12 hour limit, the DFLS, the full block methods are almost entirely hitting this 12 hour limit. But these block methods, uh, particularly when you've got very small blocks, are much less likely to hit this timeout. And that's the reason that they can just keep going. So that's really good if you're constrained by linear algebra costs. Uh, using small block methods, you can massively reduce your costs there. However, there's another reason this is beneficial, uh, which works in the case where you've got expensive evaluations. Because if you've got expensive evaluations, the amount of time it takes for these full block methods to build an initial model is potentially way too expensive because for an n-dimensional model, you're gonna sample n plus one evaluation points to build a linear interpolation model. So if n is large and evaluations are expensive, you may not be able to do n evaluations of your function. So there, you need these low dimensional methods. And here I'm plotting just basic objective value reductions versus number of evaluations. And I've normalized it so that at the right end end here is where these full block methods get started. So these full block methods are sitting up the top because they make zero progress over this entire regime. But these block methods, because they only need to build, you know, evaluate the function P times to get started, they can actually get a good reduction in the objective before these other methods have even got started which is really good if you can't wait for a full n's worth of evaluations because n is large and your evaluations are expensive. So that was everything I had to say. So just overall, I should say that uh, model-based DFO is growing in maturity as a field, but in terms of scalability, it's uh, currently very limited. But the new algorithms that we've introduced based on subspaces, we can massively reduce our linear algebra cost from cubic to linear. Our iteration complexity from a strong dependency on dimension to no dependency on dimension. So we get our dimension independent complexity bounds matching the derivative base case. Uh, we've got new code that outperforms state of the art methods for large scale least squares problems. And in terms of where we're going next, we're looking at second order complexity analysis because I had some question marks in my table when I showed that earlier. Um, I want to look at how to efficiently do subspace quadratic models. Those are a lot trickier for reasons that I can explain if you want to ask a question about it. Uh, and that will really enable me to generalize this DFB GN idea to general objectives rather than just least squares. And I'm also looking at, uh, in a separate project, similar strategies in direct search methods for DFO as well. So I will leave everything there. Um, there's the archive link, there's the code on GitHub, and I will take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linden, for a really wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Super interesting. Um, so I think uh, we have a first question from uh, Derek Driggs, uh, who would be great if, uh, Derek, you want to ask uh, your the question yourself. Yes, definitely. Hi, Linden. So first of all, great talk. Uh, so thank you for that. And my question is about um, the type of convergence in your results. So I do work in stochastic optimization for finite sum problems and convergence in optimization for these types of, or sorry, convergence in probability for the these types of algorithms are usually really hard results to prove. Um, and so I see for your problems, you have convergence in probability rather than in expectation. 
And so I'm curious if there's um, a peculiarity of the problems that you're working with that allows you to get these strong results. So I know what you mean. I'll just jump back and show people uh, these results. So yeah, so we have something about the probability of the number of iterations uh, being, yeah, these iterations are bounded with some high probability and that that's, that's more general than this expectation bounds. So what we do that's very, so in the classic kind of machine learning situation, you get these expectation bounds basically by looking at one iteration at a time. So if you look at you know, SGD or something like that, you'll say in expectation over one iteration, we reduce the function by something proportional to the gradient. So the sort of uh, analysis you might get for a classic kind of first order method. Um, and then you kind of sum up those over all the iterations. What we do here that's, I guess, a bit more sophisticated and similar ideas do work uh, in the machine learning type situations is you don't just look at one iteration in expectation, you look at a whole path of iterations and you look at what happens over that whole thing. So where I've got uh, over here, I've got things like cases two and four, where I'm saying I can bound certain iterations by the number of certain other iteration types. So we're being kind of a little bit more careful with what can happen in the different scenarios compared to what a traditional, let's say, machine learning finite sum type analysis gives you. Um, but similar ideas can work. So um, I, I would look at, for instance, uh, Katja Scheinberg's at Cornell's done a lot of, uh, not at uh, Cornell, um, uh, yeah, in New York um, State has done a lot of work on this as well. Um, so that just, yeah, that analysis is out there to find as well. Okay, super. Thanks. So Derek, the, did this answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, Lyndon. Uh, can I also remind everyone that uh, you can ask uh, questions by putting them into the Q&A and then I'll read them out. And also if the panel members have a question, please uh, just speak up. Um, maybe in the meantime, uh, um, uh, I also have a question related to uh, the last, I think the last point you made in your future work slide. Um, where you said you might also want to look beyond model-based DFO uh, and look at, at subspace methods uh, for other DFO type algorithms. So do you want to say a, a bit more uh, about this? Yeah, so direct search is kind of the, let's say the main competitor to model-based methods. Um, in general, if I had to very briefly summarize, and I apologize if there are any experts in the audience, but I'd roughly say model-based tends to be more effective in practice and direct search is simpler. So the simpler methods mean that actually they can tackle a much broader range of problems than what model base can do. Mm. So with direct search, there's similar ideas where what you basically do is you, let's say we, we want to minimize something and we're starting in a particular location in space. What we might do is just take a step northeast, south and west and pick the best point. If all of them were worse than where we are currently, we'll take shorter steps next time. So direct search, you can do a similar idea. Instead of taking northeast, south and west, you can just step in maybe north and south or randomly pick a compass direction and search that way. So those methods exist, they already improve the complexity, but I think we can do a little bit more and get this dimension independent bound if we use similar techniques. Okay, 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 interesting, thank you. Uh, the, now questions are coming in also in the Q&A uh, and I'll read them first and then I'll hand over to you, Des. Um, so Nick uh, Gold uh, asks, what are implications of parallelism for your approaches? Yeah, this is a really good question. And so one of the things that comes out, depend, it sort of depends on the level of parallelism you have. So the most kind of, I guess, relevant situation I would see is where you can evaluate the objective function multiple times simultaneously in parallel. So if you can do that, then again, it depends on the number of processes that you have. If you have essentially as many processes as you have variables, then the cost of finite differencing to get a full gradient is essentially the cost of one evaluation. So in that case, you may well just be better off doing finite differencing. Um, if you've got no parallelism, then generally speaking, the DFO is gonna help a lot more if your evaluations are expensive. But then you've got this really interesting high, sort of in-between regime where you have, maybe you can do five evaluations in parallel, but you've got a hundred dimensional problem. There, mm. it's not really clear, do you do you know, five evaluations in parallel 20 times to get a gradient, or do you do one evaluation in parallel, you know, not, not, not at all parallel and do a fully DFO? Both of those would work, but there should be kind of a hybrid sort of regime sitting somewhere in the middle. And that's really not something that's well studied. Um, it's something that I think there's a lot of potential benefit to be had, but at the moment we don't really know what the best use of that kind of 
let's say partial parallelism is yet. Um, but I think there's potential for some really good work to be done in that area. Super, thank you, super interesting. Um, Nick has another question. So the question is, do you see different behaviors uh, for large residual problems versus small residual problems? Uh, again, uh, good question, Nick. Um, so I guess, so partly the reason that Nick is asking this is because if we go back to this Gauss-Newton type approximation, theoretically, there's a difference in convergence rate depending on whether you're converging to a point where R is zero or close to zero uh, versus when R is large. And what I've, I've not really found a big distinction, but that's not something I've really studied closely, partly because I've not looked at high accuracy solutions because I've sort of found that the subspace methods really struggle to get uh, the way, I, at least the way I've got it working here, it doesn't really get to high accuracies. Um, so we're not really in that regime where this kind of local convergence rates appear. Um, and as I think, you know, there's probably room to improve these techniques in that regime. But in sort of my mind, if we're looking at expensive evaluations and large scale problems, to be honest, I'm kind of happy getting low accuracy solutions uh, at least as something that we can get practically out. So the short answer is I don't really know what distinctions that we get um, at this stage. In the non-subspace regime, uh, actually we don't see a massive kind of, uh, you know, zero residual, large residual kind of uh, differentiation in practice um, compared to using sort of say a more Newton type method rather than the Gauss-Newton type method, which is perhaps a little bit surprising. And it's probably something to do with the accuracy levels we look at in DFO. We don't really look at this sort of high accuracy local regime so much. So even in the non-subspace methods, I've not really seen a clear differentiation of the two categories. Mm. Mm. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Des. Hey, hi, Lyndon. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, using interpolation does seem to suggest that you're sort of assuming exactness of those samples that might not be necessary. Are there any other ideas, you know, some sort of best fit to, to your points that would work just as well? Uh, so this is a really interesting area. So absolutely. Um, so the classic example being, you know, one of the use cases of DFO is when we've got noisy evaluations. So why are we interpolating to them? It's the natural question that comes up. So the first thing that you can do is do, say, regression rather than interpolation. So oversample the function in the neighborhood and do like a least squares type fit. Uh, some people even go a little bit further and use techniques like Gaussian processes um, and those types of models to approximate the function as well. Um, in the basic case of just interpolation versus regression, we end up with a really odd situation that regression is possibly a bit too pessimistic in terms of the number of evaluations that you need to get things working. And it turns out that um, I've even tried things like inexact interpolation. So rather than exactly hitting the function values with your model, just get close, um, sort of close everywhere, assuming that your noise is sort of small. And it, for reasons that I'm not aware that anyone understands, DFO does much worse if you don't exactly interpolate, even if the values you're interpolating to aren't good. Uh, I'm not the only one to experience this, and we really, as far as I'm aware, have no idea why this is the case. I would be absolutely fascinated if someone could figure it out. Um, but certainly regression is something that can help, yeah. Okay, Lyndon, I think uh, we are, uh, the, ti the time is over. Uh, yeah. It would be okay. very interesting to discuss more, but I think we need to move on to the next talk. Thank you so much okay. again for a great talk. Thank uh, you, thanks for all the, thanks everyone.